This is BBC One. Good afternoon. In two minutes, the start of the new regular weekday news afternoon. Presented by Whitmore and Moira's... Welcome to this is Geeky Sci-Fi TV, where we are joined by two great authors, uh, Dave Lawrence and Steve Butterstone, who have just released their latest book, Scar for Life, Volume 2, The 80s, uh, available on lulu.com. Uh, guys, welcome once again. Thanks for joining us. Uh, well, thank for you. those people who have not heard anything about the Scar for Life uh, project, could you give, me, give us a bit of an intro and uh, tell us a bit of the history of how it came about? Yeah, well, it was my old, yeah, my old day job up until last month, basically. Um, I've known Dave, what is it? God, it's 26 years now. It's gotta be something gotta be. like that, yeah. Um, yeah, like our oldest customer basically um, became a good friend, and it was one of those workplace discussions we had, me, you, and my colleague, my friend called Col. It was one of those conversations that was basically an hour and a half, two hours of. Oh, do you remember that TV show? Oh, do you remember that comic? Do you remember that magazine? Do you remember that book? Just while away the day on a, on a slow day. And we realised at the end of a couple of hours, literally everything we talked about was either incredibly violent, incredibly scary, eerie, incredibly inappropriate, racist, you name it, and largely geared for children. So I kind of got kind of fired up and thought, well, I want to read about this. I want to read the book. There will obviously be a book, millions of nostalgia books about the 70s and 80s. I want to read the book about the dark side. So I went on Amazon, went on every book site going, couldn't find it. And it was cold, wasn't it? We basically said, well, you like writing. Why don't you write it? And I laughed it off. And later that night, I started making notes. I thought, well, why not? Didn't think anything would happen a bit. Um, started writing and realized what an enormous project it'd be about a week later wasn't it Dave you said kind of you yeah. fancied the same thing so do you need to and wait was it always going to be like one book for the 70s and 80s which mm -hmm. seems laughable now but yeah what three and a half years later yes three started, like, oh, and a half oh. long years yeah. <laughs> yeah my god there was some computer meltdowns relationship breakups but there we went <laughs> it was it was a roller coaster wasn't it it was, it was, but that was the thing. Remember, I always said, if we sold 200 copies in its entire lifespan, yeah. I'd be delighted. And, God, well, you know all the stats and figures. I do. It's, so, but when yeah. we, because Steve was saying, oh, if we sell 200 copies, that would be great. And I said, no, a thousand. Let's be ambitious. Let's say a thousand. We sold Steve's estimate on the first half of the first day. Oh, that's insane. insane. We bypassed. The show. What? what we've mined this is what it means to our generation that, that no one else has done this but yeah it's um, certainly tapped the vein 
that's a yeah. deep seated thing in our generation, a kind of buried memories and kind of how many people have we seen on Twitter? Kind of like, oh, the Eggman, the Kinderman. I've forgotten about yeah, them. absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's it just you, you do a post of something massively obscure, and you get like twenty replies, thirty replies, forty replies saying, "Oh my god, I remember that? Do you remember this bit as well?" And people go, "Oh yeah, I do." And that like it just goes on. It's it's got a life of its own now, really. It's just uh, everybody's got something they remember in the back of their mind, a little little seed of fear from their childhoods that blossoms into life, if you like, when uh, you just remind them of it. So it, 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 it works amazing, really it well. How much these things that were. Uh, scary in our childhoods that now when you look back at them they give you a bit of a buzz and oh yeah I love that and you've got a massive following on Twitter um, have you had any uh, feedback from kind of like famous people or experts we yeah we um, do you want to go first thing I was going to say I think it was one of the weirdest buzziest moments of certainly this part of our lives was getting a direct message from uh, Mark Gattis but we've had Mark Gattis, Andy Nyman, Darren Brown following up. I mean, yeah, it's it's the, the celebrities, there's kind of famous people following us, occasionally jogging in. And I was just Katie Puckett, who we used to really yeah. admire us kind of following and liking stuff. I did I did a tweet about Hamble from Play School. <laughs> and Rick uh, and, and Rick Jones, Mr. Finger Bobs himself, replied from Arizona, USA to say, don't say anything bad about Hamble. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so he, he follows us. Uh, we yeah, we've got a load of yeah. There's quite a few. I, I still get giddy. You know, um, I mean, one, one I particularly like because I love horrible histories is Jim Howick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim Howick is a, is a uh, he follows the Twitter. Um, we, we've heard rumours, of course, about Peter Jackson having a copy of the book. Ooh, we've really? heard, uh, that was a big one. Yeah, that was a big one. Uh, yeah, there's there's loads. And as I said, I was saying to you before we started, David. Um, I've been able to approach more people uh, for the second book and say, could you just talk to us about this? So, I mean, it was absolutely lovely. David Wiltshire was fantastic. He wrote the uh, the novel upon which uh, The Nightmare Man is based. The um, Annette Ekblom, the actress in Noah's Castle. She was lovely. Um, Andy Nan was, Andy Nan was fantastic. Andy, Andy Nan was absolutely brilliant, yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely great bloke. Uh, he... he, he very kindly gave me half an hour of his time for a for an interview just like this. Um, did you manage to see his uh, stage play? With Jen, uh, Jen, he did the stage play with Jeremy Dyson of Ghost Stories. Yeah. Um, yes. Me, me and my wife went to see it when he was in the West End. And she, she spent most of it sort of like with her eyes in the chest. She didn't look. But it was such an incredible <laughs> experience. That I absolutely loved it. And like you say, you know, he, seems, he seems a pretty dead-on guy, you know. Oh, he, he absolutely is. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a very approachable, very, very, very. Ch he seemed genuinely excited to get a copy of the book. I mean, genuinely excited, uh, yeah. which was which was great. Um, and I did say to him, I said, "Look, when the, sh the stage shows get back going, uh, we'll get you some tickets. You can come and see us." And he, he and his son seemed genuinely thrilled at the prospect Brilliant. of coming to see us, which is surreal. That's the thing, Dave. Do you know that, that thing we always talk about it, don't we? When and they will come back be back up and running the live shows yeah hopefully this year definitely 2022 absolutely but to flip it on its head we we will never get used to that thing in intermissions and breaks when people come up to us almost yeah. kind of kind of talk to you and you're like yeah we're just a couple of chances from the <laughs> but it's so surreal it's 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 a very I mean yeah it's very surreal I mean even the very first thing we did the very first thing we ever did was we went to a place called Down and Market in in Norfolk um, and the, the, and during the during the interval this lady came up to me and she just she liked to see said she just kind of sidled up and we'd had a bit of an issue with the script remember the guy had, had told us the wrong amount of time we were on uh, so we had to cut like like half an hour out of each of our talks basically. Um, so that's my and she's oh what were you gonna say? So we are you can't have my script and she seemed genuinely thrilled that I gave her this piece of paper yeah. that I printed out with my script on <laughs> or something. It's like yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's a bizarre experience. It's I mean I've I've signed my autograph. I know exactly how many times I've done it, so I'm not I'm not Star Trek yet. But uh, yeah, I've I've <laughs> yeah, it's weird. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit more about the the format of the live show? What people can expect when it is back up and running again? 
Well, we, I mean, we have, we have obviously have uh, Bob Fisher, the host with the most, uh, who introduces the show, and then he sort of says he sort of prompts us to give um, anecdotes and stories, and and we have like little interactive bits, and uh, it works really well. Yep, yeah, we've got the top of the pops theme. Uh, we have a rundown of the top ten nuclear war themed pop songs of the nineteen eighties, um, which will be in Scar for Life Volume Three. But we do it in the guise of Janice Long and Dave's John Peel. Um, we have a little bit of a Generation Games conveyor belt sequence to do with protect and survive all of the various items that you would be expected to carry into your inner refuge, including, and it's in the pamphlet, a cuddly toy <laughs> to keep the kids. <laughs> but yeah, it's gone from kind of a very um, tight talk that we gave it down on market into this a bit of a production, a bit of a show. We do give people value for money, I think. Well, yeah, the one we the one we did with the guy, sorry, uh, the one we did with the guy, uh, with the lighting guy who did all the the, the air raid wow. sounds, and that was that was great. <laughs> amazing, that was Kept amazing. Setting off the four minute warning every so often at random. We so, yeah. so. <laughs> well, can see the audience kind of going. <gasps> yeah, it will start. It will start. <laughs> that, was, that was really good. Um, now, getting back to the, the latest book, one thing I love about you, you get a lot of these books of horror films or whatever. And it is pretty much just a straight review of each film or program. This book very much places it in the sort of social context of the time. Now, at the moment, we've had things like Stranger Things and the Wonder Woman film, and they've got a very particular way of portraying the 80s. But I think what we often forget is that it was quite a strange, dark time as well. It wasn't just warm and, and live aid and... Rubik's Cubes, it, you know, it was the Cold War, it was AIDS, it was unemployment. And the book uh, does that very well. It, it explains all that. So even if, you know, so you wasn't alive in the 80s or you don't remember the 80s, reading it is, is, is a really uh, valuable education on that decade. Yeah, I think, I mean, a couple of the pieces I wrote, I mean, I think I wrote about think T Street isn't cool. working, uh, about unemployment in Birkenhead, this, this documentary about unemployment in Birkenhead. Uh, and I experienced that firsthand, obviously, because I, there's, a, there's a story in the, the book about how I used to go to the tip with my dad, and you have these people hovering, waiting to try and scrabble through the rubbish to find things to, you know, to survive, to sell, to to use. Um, and I, I saw that firsthand. So it's, I think it's a, because we're slightly older as well. I think we're experiencing the '80s far more from a more grown-up perspective. I think when you're very little. If things are okay, you, you, your parents protect you very much from what's going on in the background. I think you know, uh, like my, when my, obviously when I was little, my dad was, there was power cuts. My dad was on a three day week. It was there was things going on that were worrying, but it always seemed like an adventure. By the time you get to the eighties and you're a bit older, you know what's going on. It's not an adventure anymore. It's just bleak. You know, I think that that's that's a very important part. I think of what we're writing about now. When um, we started volume one. We just had the aim of looking at pop culture in the 1970s, look the darker side and our memories, what it did to us. And we realized very quickly that we're telling the story of Britain in the 1970s. So uh, the British society in the 1970s through its dark pop culture. So that obviously that carried on into the 1980s. And everyone, like you said, with Wonder Woman 1984 and Stranger Things, it's neon grids and Testarossa cars and Miami Vice. But there's the one that anyone that grew up in that decade remembers, which is, as you said, AIDS, heroin. And for me, it's the knowledge that I was convinced I was not gonna live to see 1990 because the world would blow up, there would be a nuclear war. So it's these two weird, the glossy, bright 1980s clashing with that bleak decade that we all remember. And that's even more prevalent in volume two, I think, even more than volume one. And volume three is going to be full of it with the Cold War. So, yeah, it's telling that story of, yeah, there were neon grids, there were um, leggings and sort of big haircuts. But the three of us, I think, will remember a very dark decade indeed. In the middle, like, we've got like Transformers and we've got, um, we've got like Robocop cartoons and we've got like Nightmare and stuff like that. But there's a black cloud hanging over that decade. That's, that's only there for the people that were, were alive in it. And so it's not just um, Nosy Bunk and 
ghosts and Salem's lot. It's unemployment and discovering girls, but then AIDS is around. So you're going to die if you have sex. And there's the heroin epidemic and obviously nuclear war. So there's, there's real world terrors as well in there, which is a hell of a decade. It, and it makes for a fascinating book. One of the things that really took me back was the moment where you're talking about when you used to get a news flash in the 80s. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. You would just get that um, graphics car coming up, news flash, and for the, the five sort of seconds that it was on there, in silence, you, you know, your stomach would drop, you, you'd just think, oh, shit. <laughs> No, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because a, a newsflash generally meant that something really bad had happened. Something so bad that they would interrupt, I don't know, Blue Peter. Something, you know, yeah, something. That, that was big. You know, there's, there's um, yeah, so you, you, yeah, your heart would be in your mouth, wouldn't it? Just for a, a, a second. And quite often it was something very grim. You know, yeah. I think also because of the, because of the technology uh, advancing over in the decade, you started to get news items that were very immediate. Like like the SAS storm in the Iranian embassy, like you'd experience it there and then. For example, yeah. the first people to see the um, the explosion of the space shuttle were people who were watching John Craven's news round. I remember that very well. I remember watching it, horrified. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. the first people who saw that were children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so you know that's that's what I'm saying. It's 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 um, news flashes were a very we're, we're, we're a very uh, traumatic experience, I think, all around. The, later on, they started to be a bit more news flash. There was a news flash I didn't include in, in the piece. At the, there was a news flash about um, Richard Branson's balloon crashing in Ireland when he tried to a transatlantic, you know, which isn't really a news flash material, yeah. really, is it? Richard Branson's <laughs> balloon thing is just, it's, it's come to the sticky end. It's, that's not really news flash like SAS or Challenger or Chernobyl or. A country getting invaded, but, but yeah. one of the things was, have they pressed the button? For me in yeah. the early 80s, if it, oh, something was the blue pizza, it was... Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, because the Russians went into Afghanistan, I think, in late 1979, didn't they? So, the, I mean, and yeah. it, just, it just got really tense from that point onwards. I mean, you know, the, there were Olympic boycotts from both sides of the... Uh, you know, the, the world is, is it, yeah, so you would think, okay, the Russians are in Afghanistan, um, you'd have the Americans making all of these very gung-ho Rambo films saying this is what we'd do to the Russians if we went in. It's just, so it wasn't, it, everything was politically charged and everything was very, uh, you were very much aware that big things were happening in the world that you couldn't control. And I yeah. think the new is part of that, you're not in control of that. It's suddenly, it's, it's in your house, it's in your, you know, this this news from the outside that you you've got no control over, that you don't know what's going on, what's happened. So, so you also cover all the uh, the big sci-fi programs of the day. Obviously, there's a lot on Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, yeah, we 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 decided. I mean, the th the thing is, I think every Doctor Who book conceivable has been written. So yeah. we just I think we just picked a top five scary moments each, or something like that, because uh, you know, you, what can you say about Doctor Who that hasn't been said a thousand times already by for example, Andrew Pixley. <laughs> that was the thing. The volume one, we, we nearly didn't include Doctor Who at all for the exact reason that Dave just said. And we found a way of not talking about the programme itself, but what it meant to us as children. So it's the Doctor Who exhibition. Um, it was those weird annuals, those bizarre 1970s Tom Baker annuals that were kind of produced by people who didn't have reference photos. Um, so it would be... Tom Baker in a white suit and random actor and actress to portray Harry Sullivan and um, Sarah Jane Smith. And those backup strips in Doctor Who Weekly that didn't include the Doctor, it was almost like incredibly dark comic strips about what would happen if the Doctor wasn't there to save the day. So we had to find an angle on Doctor Who in Volume 1. And I think with Volume 2 in the 80s, they really were pushing the envelope in terms of violence and um, vomit. That was my number one, with the vomiting Cybermen and um, the five doctors, because they've got a vomiting phobia. But then there's the uh, Lytton getting his hands crushed in um, Attack of the Cybermen. It was like Adric's death, I think. Um, oh, your number one was possibly... My, I think my number one was Kane's face melting, I think. I think it was. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm quite. I'm quite looking forward to the, 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 the release in the season twenty four box set. Are they? I'm quite hoping they have the full ten minute shot of that where his eyeball rolls down his cheek. <laughs> you know what? At, at the time, um, I kind of got a different view of it now. But at the time, once Peter Davison had left, I, I kind of lost interest. And me too. The, the, the McCoy era is generally one that's. It's not. I don't know whether it, it's certainly not the fault of the actors, but. Um, the kind of BBC budgets at the time and the, perhaps the writing wasn't so great on some of the episodes, but that special effects in Dragon, Dragonfire, where his face melts came, that is incredibly well done for a BBC show. Yeah, at, at half seven in the evening as well, so you've got yeah. you to factor in the time it was on as well. That's an incredible piece of work. It's horrible in any context, but at the time, it was opposite like Coronation Street or something, you know, so you turn over from Coronation Street, you know, Mini Caldwell's cat's gone missing again, and you'd have somebody's face melt on BBC One. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And then we cover Blake Seven, which had one mm. of the most uh, shocking final episodes of any series ever. Ru ruined my Christmas in 1981. <laughs> Absolutely ruined it. I'd, I'd gone out that night, I've said this before, I went out that night, um, uh, there was a school club thing on, and it, uh, I remember I set the tape for Blake Seven, in the last episode, and also um, uh, Sweeney Two, uh, which also doesn't have the most cheerful ending in the world. What, uh, what a great night of entertainment, though! Yeah, well, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> I, looked, I, I had that tape for years. Um, yeah, no, it, it, that was a pretty bleak watch. That tape, I'll be honest with you. I was I was I was, re I was really down after the episode of Blake Seven. I thought, you know what? I'll watch the uh, I'll watch Sweeney Two cheer myself up. And it wasn't. It was going badly, and then it then he then Regan burst into the bedroom at the end. I don't, don't want to spoil it for anybody. I, stop listening now. Regan burst into the, the bedroom at the end as the guy shoots himself with a sawed-off shotgun. The brain splatter all over the wall. It was horrible. That was the it's worst thing, and, and the best one as well. It's one of the most realistic effects yeah. I've ever seen. It, it looks like spaghetti bolognese. It's just and Regan's reaction to burst into that room and seeing that guy's head splattered is was mine. It was just he kind of he's kind of putting his hand over his face and choking. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, I can see, yeah. yeah. With Blake Seven, I still think to this day it's one of the most audacious endings to a TV show ever. But they kind yeah. of just went seven people who try to take down a galactic empire. Of course, you're going to lose, and they lose spectacularly. And the bad guys just go on to crush the entire galaxy with the heel. That's amazing. That's yeah, really it is. Amazing. Well, I mean, they even signal that in the. I think in the second episode ever. Avon says, you know he cannot win. Yeah. They actually, they actually signpost how it's going to end in the second episode. He says, you know he can't win. Absolutely. You can never win. And staying with the, the sci-fi theme, um, kind of mid-80s, I was growing out of the, the stage where sort of Doctor Who scared me and things like that. Um, but uh, V was on in 84. And that oh, was... Yeah. For people who weren't alive at that time, it's kind of like... It was a big event... Uh, program. It was kind of the Game of Thrones or Stranger Things of its day. It was on roughly yeah. about the same time as the Olympics, I think. And that's always melded in my mind with it. Um, and it was, at the time, scary. I think David oh, I got a few ideas from that. Absolutely. It was a massive cultural event. I thought, you're right. I think it's something that people just remember fondly. But if you were alive then, that was, that was the Game of Thrones. That was the Stranger Things. The country talked about V, and it was it was marketed as a major television event by ITV, who couldn't get any Olympic coverage. So they thought, we'll, we'll get this sci-fi thing in. And everyone chose to watch that, rather than the running, or the shop, or whatever it was. And you'll obviously remember the alien bear that yeah. everyone talked about the next day, the green alien that, that popped its head up, which now is looks like what it is. It's a sock puppet. But that horrified me at the time. I remember, David, I remember in an English lesson, we had to give a 10 minute talk about something that we were into at the time. And I gave a 10 minute talk about V because I was talking about like the Nazi parallels. There was a, a, lot, a lot of parallels to do with um, Nazi Germany. There was a visitor youth that inducted America's teenagers into wearing visitor gear. Um, even stuff like the, the rat eating when Diana opens her jaw unnaturally wide and pops a rat into her mouth. You look at that effect now, it looks incredibly shoddy, but at the time it was horrifying. But yeah, V was incredible. But obviously the, um, 
they pissed all over themselves when they turned it into a weekly show. And it kind of turned into Dynasty in Space with cat fights yeah. and glitter makeup. <laughs> oh, still love it, though. Still love it. One of the great tragedies of that era was uh, that we never got a third series of the Tripods, which, yes, as a kid, I loved that series. I've never seen it. I can't, I can't <laughs> comment. I've never seen it. <laughs> Fair enough. So that was another one I liked, but I didn't love. I watched it at the time because it was sci-fi, yeah, yeah. but I, I found it dragged horribly. I really loved uh, War of the Worlds is my favourite book ever. So I started watching it because it was tripods, and I thought it was I actually thought it was to do with the Martians, but I kind of got sucked in. But there's there's periods of it that kind of drags on and on. But yet, it's another one I liked but didn't love. But I know a lot of people out there have a lot of affection for that show, and that third series is the holy grail. <laughs> Even now, that there's the hope that it will come back and it will resolve itself. Well, I think I had a very interesting discussion through our direct messages with one of our followers. Um, a doctor in Ontario, Canada, but she made the good point. She said, basically said, two books in and not a single, well, only one female voice and not a single um, Bane voice. And that's something that's been bugging me for years. And th this kind of, th this sort of corner of nostalgia archive telly, it does seem to be dominated by white men. And there's other voices out there. So that's why we're going to make a specific call out this week. Um, for like female writers, uh, uh, BAME writers, LGBTQ writers, because she was making a point of even survivors, something things that we touch on tangentially. She was like, well, if I'd have written it, that would have been my focus. The whole story is about a mother's search for a son. And as men, we don't get that. And she said, that's what the story is about. And I thought, God, it is. Even the woman in black, it's about, it's about a ghost. But it's about a woman whose child was ripped away from her. It's an it's a feminist ghost story. And we touched on that tangentially. So there is basically other voices out there that we're gonna use specifically call on for the rest of volume three because yeah, it's a bit of a sausage fest at the moment. So it's, it's, it's I think a problem those I have with this panel. Cool. Um, you know, we're all sort of white middle-aged guys. And I've asked yeah. loads of people to, to come on, but people are very um, shy about coming on here. I mean, I, I'm not a great lover of, of filming myself, you know, um, but I just, I like doing the channel. And I get yeah. very sort of insecure about how I look and stuff, and I understand that. But it is difficult to get different voices on board. It is. It really is. We've had one contributor already emailed me uh, from Twitter, but she was basically saying... Um, Oh, God, she had such vivid memories of threads when she was a young teenager. And even in her email, she was telling me she remembered what she was wearing when she watched threads because it's seared into her memory. So the idea for threads for volume three, as me and Dave been talking about it, is me and Dave are going to do the main pieces as in what we would normally do. Um, the making of the synopsis. We, we went to Birmingham around time this time last year. No. A great day. I remember we went to the, the motorway service station to talk to um, Simon, who's one of the producers on Threads, and it was guerrilla filmmaking. The anecdotes that he gave us were incredible, and I've never yep. seen them anywhere else. So <laughs> we're going to have those pieces by me and Dave as the centre point. But we want to kind of round the table of just what that programme means to you, what it did to your head, how it terrified you, and hopefully we'll be able to get lots of people to, like I said, David, you more than welcome well, to join in and talk about what it meant to you. It's kind of a, a running joke with my friends and family how obsessed with it I am. And the weird thing is, it's not wow. something I would stick on to watch. Yeah. I do own it. I do own it. But, you know, if I, if I watch it, I kind of brave clips of it or I watch the extras, the extras on the Blu-ray. But it's not something that's a comfortable watch. Um mm. But I've got vivid memories of watching it because I was only 11 at the time. And it was the only thing I've seen in my lifetime on TV that I've kind of gone to bed and I was in a cold sweat and really, really terrified and worried because it felt yeah. so real. Well, I had my first anxiety attack when I was 13, thinking about nuclear war. I've had anxiety on and off my entire life, but that was the first time ever. That I, I had a panic attack 
But um, I'm the same. I've watched it three times since 1984, and every single time, once when it was on, which destroyed me for life, once in the 1990s, which was the only decade I can remember that was kind of happy and peaceful and people were enjoying themselves, and it destroyed me for another week. And I've watched it once since then, and it wrecked me for another week. So I made a joke about this on Twitter a few weeks ago, that me and Dave have been in a kind of Rocky-style training montage for years, trying to psych ourselves up to watch it again, to write about it. Because you can't just stick it on and watch it. You can't. It, yeah, it's, it's, right. not, it's not a thing you... It's a thing you have to watch. It's not a thing you enjoy watching. It's like Schindler's List. Yeah. I, I don't even understand how they sold... You know DVDs of Threads or Schindler's. Who says, "Oh, watch that again"? That's a, that was a a rollicking good <laughs> ride. I want to see that. Yeah, you know, it's it's that kind. Of, it's an important yeah. film to say. It's an important. But so, I mean, obviously, you know, it's like the Titanic. You go see Titanic. You know the ship's gonna sink, right? You know, you know what's gonna happen roughly in it. But it's how it happens, and you know, and the aftermath of that that are the most traumatic things in the whole piece. I think so. But you have to see it. Nothing prepares you as well. No matter yeah. how much you read about threads, nothing will prepare you for threads. Yeah. Nothing will prepare you for threads. No, it's true. Um, it's, it's weird. If we're going back to my own memory of watching it, and I can still see in my mind's eye, our family sat around as a family unit watching it on TV, and it was the repeat I watched the, the following year after it had been on. It was the one that was on the summer holiday in 85. And um, it had finished, and the four of us were just like staring. It was, it, we was all really affected by it. And I just remember my dad um, in a vain attempt to sort of try and cheer the family up. He turned it over to ITV uh, to watch TJ Hooker. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember not being able to concentrate on TJ Hooker at all. You know, William Shatner and his wig blessing, but I couldn't. You know, what I'd just seen was so disturbing. It was, I don't know, he's just my dad trying to cheer us up before we went to bed. That was, that was a pretty bleak week on the BBC, wasn't it? Because they were, they, I, I was going to say celebrating, they were, they were marking the 40th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a yeah. series of programmes to mark the 40th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. So it's not only those loads of programmes on about nuclear war that week, it's that it reminds you that, oh yeah, this can happen, this has happened, and it could happen again yeah. any time now, I think was probably... Mm -hmm. There was a Newsnight discussion, news discussion about um, yeah. threads, direct reference, that on the eighth day, the documentary about um, nuclear winter, and then you got the, the QED episode that haunted me as well, um, about a very dispassionate, emotionless, blow-by-blow -blow account of what would happen if a nuclear weapon detonated in London. And that's, oh God, I mean, the war game getting repeated for the first, or getting shown for the first time, which is still, for me, it's inches, threads as well. It's horrifying. But that was. Yeah, a... I'm, I'm watching the war game right now. I'm watching. I'm going through that right now. Yeah, it, it's it, if it's because it's like a documentary. I think it's 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 a more documentary approach to the same subject, uh, and so it has it's impactful in a different way. But it's still impactful. It's still very shocking. I mean, you know, I mean, threads up to the point where the, you know the nuclear bomb goes off is it basically like a little soap opera going on in the foreground. In the background, the yep. world's going to shit in, on the radio, on the TV. Oh, yeah, this is invasions happening. This is so you kind of get you get to experience it like they do, not really paying attention to what's going on. Whereas I think the war game is far more like it is like a documentary film crew following people around a bit like you do with Culloden, where it does it as a like a, a documentary, like a, a to camera documentary thing. Yeah, so it's a different approach, but like I say, it's, it's I think that more factual, cold approach makes it more shocking as well. I so you're right, it is, it is like that, it's, uh, which one's more effective? Sorry. It's like you said about the soap opera approach in Threads there, day because Barry Hines' original idea was to have most of the cast of Coronation Street playing the major players because he felt that the British public would connect to those yeah. cosy actors more, but obviously it would take it out of the drama. Yeah. And we were talking about this the other week, weren't we? We've got a bit of a revelation about the woman who is on it? Yes, yes. Anne Sellers for Volume Three. It's not Anne Sellers. And found out some stuff about threads. Really? Anne Sellers. But yeah, there's a revelation about it. Yeah. Okay, that'll be interesting. It is not. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's one thing that I was just thinking then about um, 
getting contributors to give their uh, memories of it for volume three. Uh, it would be really interesting to get someone um, who wasn't alive at the time to watch it now and get their perspective yeah. on it. Yeah, we've talked about this in the past, haven't we? Steve? We what we want to yeah. at some point go. To, I mean, go go take take material and show it to school children or six form or something like that and get a reaction because one of my favourite single quotes in the first book is I showed uh, an, a, a, a clip to uh, a, a 16 year old girl um, that I, I was teaching at the time. I said, what do you think of this? And, and her response was, Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was her single response to the whole thing. But it's Which, nice to know it still has an effect. It's, it's yeah, ab ab absolutely. It's, it's good to know that these things can still have the power to shock and to affect. And you know. yeah, that's the thing with the round, the threads round table, which will form the core of the yeah. Cold War section. That's the thing, is it? It's to get people who watched it first time round, watched it later, and hopefully a couple of people who watch it for the like one of my best friends watched it for the first time last year, and she was absolutely traumatized. All day, just wrecked their head. So it's it's not it's not like it will, people will watch it and go meh, because it's it's I think it's the single best British drama that's ever been made. Personally, I, do, I think I it's just on every level it's stunning. But yeah, it'd be lovely to see like a teenager if we want to put them through it, um, friend maybe friends, children or something. But get that reaction, that cold, yeah, reaction would be lovely. I often wonder. Sorry, I often wonder that if it was repeated now, uh, what the Twitter reaction would be. Oh, that's a, a, an interesting question. I don't, yeah, you should do a tweet along to watching threads and see how that goes. Because there'll always be the people going, I can't believe anyone was scared by this. Was even, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always someone who's going to be dead hard out there. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to, to, I think people need to go into it cold in a way i think you need to get involved in the drama you know it's because like going back to titanic and you're always waiting for the ship to sink the yeah. first the first two hours uh you know just you know saying when's the ship gonna sink when's the ship? so you, i think you need to you'd need to show it to people cold and they just you know uh, enjoy yeah. it uh, in the moment <laughs> yes. enjoy yes another, another thing that was scary in a different way back in the 80s before um i'd seen anything like that but when I was at primary school, um, Grange Hill, you would watch that and you would see all these things going on, you know, the grip of steps and stuff and things like that. And you would think, is this what I'm in for in a couple of years? Well, that's the thing. That was that was my specialist subject, David. It was um, It's my favourite TV show of all time to this day. So it's got a very dear place in my heart. So that was, that was my section, um, volume two. But obviously everyone remembers. I mean, I've... There's so much to talk about in 80s Grange Hill because that was the golden age from start to finish. It's absolutely incredible. That was all the iconic characters, the big storylines. And I chose to talk about the deaths. There's um, some fairly big character deaths in the 80s in Grange Hill. But everyone obviously remembers Zamo and the heroine storyline that was huge. But I chose to end on another storyline. You talk about Gripper Stepson. I actually think the story's better and bigger almost. That last year when Gripper Stepson, before he got chucked out, is horrifying because he basically becomes a white supremacist and forms a kind of national front in the school and makes the black kids swear allegiance to the British race. And it doesn't pull back from anything. There's some stuff in there the, you'll just look at it and think, God, those teachers would have been fired on the spot. I don't remember Bullet Baxter, yeah, the yeah, games yeah. teacher, but he's basically hauling kids around everywhere, left, right, and centre, just grabbing them. He gets Gripper and dunks him under a cold tap by the head. Um, but that entire storyline was stunning, and it was very of its time. It was like kind of just coming up to the mid eighties. It's got, got some of the, my favourite television moments ever. But you're right. I always I started the piece with the very same thing. I remember my very first day in secondary school being terrified and I was taken there by my dad. And one of the things that was in the head was going, oh, my God, is it going to be like Grange Hill? <laughs> I was petrified because it did. It kind of prepared you for secondary school. But it also made you think, oh, my God, am I am I going to get 
bullied? Am I going to get duffed up? Am I going to get my head put down the toilet? But yet it was, there was a lot of scares and anxieties to do with school. The the great great was an interesting one. I mean, uh, my partner, Alex, she's never seen it before. Uh, and she normally doesn't, isn't too impressed with some of the rupee old TV shows I watched on TV. Uh, but we started watching Grange Hill on uh, Britbox. Uh, the first four series are on there now. And I watched one episode, so oh, it's rubbish this. And we're on season four now. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Because it's the best yeah, thing ever. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. But, but the point, going back to what you said about teachers, they wouldn't do that. There's loads of things that they would not do that now. There was uh, the one I watched last night was one where um, Brian Capron was it, Mr. Hoppy Hopwood. Right, you know, um, yeah. he finds he finds Alan he finds Alan smoking and he slaps him around the head. You think, yeah, you'd be sacked. <laughs> you'd be actually sacked about that, you know. Uh, no questions. Huh? No, and, and there's some very um, inappropriate behaviour with some of the girl pupils as well, like arms around shoulders and all sorts. I'm thinking no, that that no. Yeah, my God, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. you'll have seen the famous episode then, the one-off, completing one with them. Um, I can't remember the. The other games teacher, who's basically yes. physically abusing the kids, and yes, Mr. Yes, Baxter yes. sees him do it. The excuse was he slipped on the wet floor and he chins him. <laughs> and I remember, remember he goes, "Oh, slipped on the wet floor, did you?" I was like, "What?" Yeah, but there's, there's a lot of kids. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously Tucker gets the cane in one episode, doesn't it? Um, there's just he's, this kids getting slapped around left, right, and centre. Yeah, you no, know, I was just thinking. Watching that, thinking that, that that would never happen now, you'd, you'd be sacked within five seconds. You'd be, you know, I mean, uh, Benny Green getting racially abused by Doyle in series well, one. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not obviously not gonna repeat the word now, but that that conversation between Trisha Yates and Benny Green in the art gallery, yeah, you know, I know exactly that, what you mean. That, that word would not be on TV now, no, 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 it's incredible, no, it is incredible, you know, it's it, it, but, but I like that, it's it's a, it's tackling it head on. It's yeah. not. It's not doing euphemism. It's not doing anything. It's saying this is this is how people talk. This is what's going on. And, and, and it's I, wrong. I, yeah, that, I think that's a very powerful thing. And, it, yeah. it, and obviously, because Alex is watching it now, it stands up to, to the test of time. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, that's I've, I've bought the next six series on DVD, so we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what well, um, one of the most feared characters is slightly later on in the timeline of Grange Hill, but. Uh, He's playing by uh, Michael Sheard, uh, Mr. Bronson, um, who I have it on good authority. One of the places I like to uh, hang out, uh, you know, obviously when we're not in a pandemic, is Fab Cafe in Manchester. And he did, a, I think he did some appearances there. And he was famously one of the nicest guys that people had ever met. He was like helping make the sandwiches and, and stuff like that. So oh, nice. Wow. So, you know, you don't expect people to be like the roles that they play, but um, you know, such a such a, a lovely guy. He's kind of gone down in legend. Yeah, it's often the way. Well, there was, I mean, I know, I know. People say that Roger Delgado was absolutely lovely and timid, as timid as a church mouse, wasn't he? Apparently, he was. He wasn't anything like the master at all. And uh, but you, it's very strange that people do sometimes think that actors are like the characters because I know, like soap opera baddies get booed in the street, don't they? And uh, or accosted <laughs> yeah. in supermarkets. You know, I can't believe you treated Deirdre that way. You know, that kind of thing. Just, what are you talking about, that? Oh, and Cor Coronation Street makes an appearance in the book, doesn't it? Briefly. Absolutely. Yeah, it was one of mine. It was, um, and again, it's to do with my vomit phobia. But there was a period, and yet it was after EastEnders started in the mid '80s, and it suddenly burst onto the screen. The first thing you see in the first scene is a dead body. When Ali and then I think it is burst into um, Reg Cox's flat, and he's been dead for days, and it kind of sets out its stall from that moment onwards. So it is going to be dim and grimy and incredibly depressing, but. It, battered Coronation Street in the ratings after about a year. So panic stations at Coronation Street HQ. And there was a brief period of about six months to a year where they tried to beat EastEnders at its own game. And one of the big storylines was the Rovers return, um, getting burned down in a fire. At any other time, because there's been several fires in Rovers, it's kind of treated as a big thing, but it's just a television fire. This time around, they basically showed the genuine effects of a fire. So Bet Lynch is in a nighty, wakes up when all the smoke's filling the room, coughing her guts up, tries to get out but can't, gets on her hands and knees and spews thick white bile all over the carpet. 
at what, 7.30 in the evening. It's horrifying. <laughs> it's genuinely horrifying. It's, it's just real. And it just seems like it's so out of character for Coronation Street, but that's that's how far they went to try and beat EastEnders, which was doing kind of cot deaths and um, underage pregnancies and you name it. On top of, um, I think it was that terrible storyline with um, Letitia Dean and Kelvin doing the pop group that actually made it to the Oh, class. yeah, yeah, I remember that. So you, you still have I, stuff like that, innit? I, I yeah. used to bet EastEnders been on the Christmas. Because every Christmas they'd be having a knees up in the uh, the Queen Vic while somebody's pegging out in the gardens outside. It's just awful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Bloody hell. So you mentioned that uh, a lot of stuff's been held back for the third volume. So you've got all the nuclear war, Cold War stuff in there. What else is in volume three? What else can we look forward to? Basically all the stuff from volume one, like volume one split in half, it's television and then everything else. So it's volume three is going to be uh, books, comics, films, games and toys, uh, the paranormal, and the, the the final third is going to be the Cold War. But that even that includes television, um, board games, uh, just all the Cold War paraphernalia and pop culture that we had. So it's a huge variety of dark pop culture for Volume Three. Really looking forward to that one. Mm. I'm really looking forward to that, and I wish you all the success with this one. I'm sure it's going to sell even more than the first one. Uh, I've already seen the buzz on on Twitter about it. I know Starburst have given it a great review. Um, so, you know, I just wish you all the best because it's a fantastic mm-hmm. book. Uh, and hopefully, once we've got through this... Uh... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the computer's playing. <laughs> hopefully, well, once we've got through this uh, pandemic... Uh, we can get the live shows going back again. Oh, absolutely. We'll, yeah. be, we'll be back on the road as soon as we can. I think we're itching to get back out there and, uh, yeah. and talk absolutely. nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, Steve, thank you, for, thank you very much for coming on to Geeky Sci-Fi. Yeah, thank you thank for having you. us. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers, Dave.